revolutionaries in the near future. But I do think that a lot of the people that we've met here have helped us to understand that in a way all acts of compassion are ultimately somewhat political and we've heard a lot about the challenges of um, you know we're meeting incredibly heroic people who are working on the ground and you know incredibly underserved and oppressed communities um, doing really truly remarkable work but seeing um, you know hearing repeatedly what it means to, you know the challenges they face from a policy perspective and I have you know Certainly, I'm not educated enough to speak to that in any um, meaningful way, but it's it's um, made an impact, I think, for all of us to understand that um, what policy means around the world. And I think that's something Michael was alluding to as well. Um, and you know, we've also been repeatedly thanked. I mean, this I was thinking about Zoanne talked a little bit about the theme of her show, the clip she showed being outcasts and. Um, it's clearly that theme obviously echoes here as well. And we've been thanked repeatedly and, um, by the people that we've met for um, treating, for example, yesterday we went and met with um, a group who works with um, health education for sex workers. And we were thanked for treating the sex workers like just normal human people, like normal humans, which was you know, kind of astonishing to think it's like, or, or p treating people in the slums like, oh, thank you for treating them as you know, just you know, for their humanity. And it's like, well, what other response is there? And, you know, I suppose, like Che and, and Alberto, um, you know, we can't, most of us come from fairly bourgeois backgrounds and, you know, um, like them, as maybe seen in the clip, it's sort of for sheer lack of exposure, um, haven't been in these environments. And so this trip for us, I think, has, has um, I guess helped us to see that you know the humanity that is you know somewhat obvious and becomes a bit of a platitude to talk about our common and shared humanity, but there's something experientially different about it than talking about it theoretically, and hopefully that will continue to impact all of us as storytellers. So Karen, thank you. Given your extraordinary background. You clearly have strong instincts when it comes to storytelling. So what is it that you look for when developing new projects? And what are some of the key elements to a film that is both entertaining and of good quality? It's a big, tall order. <laughs> and I can only say I relate to my new friend O'Neill here of the problems of the distribution and financing. I can assure you are global and it's no easier in the supposed you know, peaceable kingdom where I work. Um, so uh, the challenges of um, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> what are some of the key elements to a film that is both entertaining and of good quality? I think, you know, really it's character. Um, and I think anyone here would give you the same answer. Um, in, the, in the Motorcycle Diaries in particular, we had um, non-fictional documentation, which was Che's actual di um, diaries from this journey, and Alberto Granado's actual diaries from the journey. So w the challenge for our writer was simply to dramatize these with some level of nuance and sophistication that didn't sort of lapse into either romanticism or propaganda, given what an iconographic ch figure Che has become over time. And we also wanted to, uh, it was important to all of the producers and to the director to try to make the film as apolitical as possible with regard to Che's later revolutionary activities, because we all fit on the political spectrum, at, I shouldn't say totally differently, but let's just say somewhat differently. Um, and so, um, there was we wanted to get at you know who Che was as a character apart from apart from the part that has you know become so legendary and I think to me the key to good character is that every every person on the planet has great contradictions we all have people in our lives and our families who we love dearly the people that are the most important in our lives and we could also list ten things about that individual or those people that drive us absolutely crazy and things that we don't like and we'd love to change about them and then you know just and you can you know do a monologue about their virtues just as well as their you know irritating habits and you know dysfunctions and all that and I think that is what makes for great character characters, you're putting all that in a blender to not create sort of these ennobled, someone else mentioned political correctness, that kind of, you know, that heroes are not, heroes are also flawed. And it's that flawed part, I think, that makes us relate to their humanity the most, rather than the 
exalted, you know, we all like to see courage, but if a character is only courageous, it just, it just challenges credibility. So I think the more the characters can be flawed and, you know, holistically recognizable as human, um, the more they speak to any audience. Thank you. And last but not least, we are going to hear from Max Burnett, uh, the creator of The Troop. Well, now that you've been inspired, you can enjoy some completely ridiculousness with me. Um, uh, it was very funny. I was uh, shocked and feel very blessed to have uh, got to come on this um, whole adventure. But as you'll see uh, on this next clip, uh, I was left wondering a little bit uh, why I was picked. Uh, except when I was asked, hey, you know, can you provide three minutes of clips from your work? Because I do children's television in America. And my show that I'm currently walk, uh, working on is about three kids who fight monsters. And so when she asked, hey, can you give three clips that it sort of has to do with the medical profession? There was a very long silence on the phone as I was scrambling to think of something. Uh, and then I said, hey, well, there was uh, a plague of ice zombies that took over the town. That could be like a metaphor for sickness that ran through the town, right? And so now you can enjoy the plague of ice zombies. Did you see a man with an extreme case of frostbite? There's definitely an ice school behind all this. Yes, he's turning everyone into ice zombies. He'll feed off their energy and then destroy them. So the whole school is at risk? Maybe the world. That's why we gotta stop them before they get out of Lakewood High. I... He won't be doing anything. International sending over a replacement unit. There's no time. We've got six hours to destroy the ice school or everyone will be stuck as ice zombies forever. What do you think International will say about that? <laughs> We have to get to the skating rink and fast before the ice school turns the whole town into zombies. Can we get this over there, quick! How'd they find us so fast? Seems they had a guy. Stockley, how could you? Most people don't look good as a zombie, but it's gotta pull it up. We're totally surrounded. We're never going to get out of here. Then we just lost Lakewood. What are you doing? I figure if we're going out, I might as well go out in style. them all more will come and we'll never get out of here you know the one nice thing about zombies is they lower the temperature it's nice and cool what can't we be both in danger and refreshed you know what a real troop member would do something really bold and unexpected right now And uh, you're probably asking why I'm here, and after watching that clip, I completely agree with you. Um, I, I, part of it, I think, was, um, and this is, you had to write like a little thing why you wanted to come on the trip, and I, I grew up in Oklahoma, which is a very rural area in the middle of the United States, um, and I grew up in a very poor part of Oklahoma. Um, 
uh, on a goat farm. So lately when I've been driving around and seeing the goats, I've really enjoyed them. Um, uh, but we, uh, I have this picture in my bedroom today in my closet. So every morning when I get up, I, I look at this picture and it's uh, of me in fifth grade. So we're all about 10 or 11 years old. And it's me and my three best friends. And we, you know, it's so funny because I took a picture in um, uh, next to the one of the dumps to, uh, yesterday of these four boys that were definitely friends because I saw them playing and they had it was this, it was kind of excuse me it tripped me up uh, the same exact shot uh, bright hopeful uh, energetic um, and when I look at that picture the thing that's so arresting about it is that uh, one of those uh, one of the boys one of my friends is a meth addict, um, so he is an extreme drug addict. Uh, meth is a, is a big drug that, especially in rural America, is a big, huge problem. Uh, the other one is serving his um, third jail sentence for grand theft auto, so he's stolen a lot of cars. Um, and the real tall one in the picture, my friend Trevin, he um, apparently, and I didn't know this while we were growing up, uh, had been uh, molested and beaten by his dad a lot, and so when he was 22 years old on his 22nd birthday, he shot himself and killed himself uh, because he couldn't deal with that history of, of what his life was. And I look at that picture and I think, here was on a very small way, um, a, 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 a community and that was on the brink and I uh, was lucky enough to get out, but I look at those friends of mine, and I think, especially now, in a global, global uh, bigger global picture, uh, that we are all intersected. We've seen this with the economic crisis, we're now seeing it with, with climate change, uh, that we're all so connected. So what are we going to do when we come up to that crisis? Are we, too, going to be looking at a picture uh, with, and we see things that have fallen away? And so, although certainly not in this uh, kids TV show, uh, but I have sold a couple of uh, feature films and that's exactly the kind, that's my starting point. What are we going to do? Are we going to be successful? Um, and so as we have gone around, and I've met people in South Africa and India, um, I myself am a bit of a pessimist and my brother always teases me that I'm willing to jump over a cliff off a cliff because I'm so uh, dark in the way that I see the world. But he also makes fun because he says that as I'm jumping over, I grab a hold with one little pinky, and that's a little bit of hope that I won't allow myself to let go. And during this whole uh, amazing trip, the one thing that I have seen, as I saw in the faces of the boys yesterday, or the people that I saw today, um, the workers and everything, there was so much hope and humanity in those people, and it's given me a little bit, excuse me, a little bit more than just a, a pinky full. And so that's what I want to do and push through in my stories. And I guess that's the reason why I'm here, is because to be inspired that way. So. Thank you so much, Max. And, you know, I'm wondering with this vision you have. Um, what are some of the challenges you have in creating children's shows that actually have uh, some social content, some content of social value? Um, in, in the States, uh, it used to be different. When I was growing up, they had um, what were called after-school specials that were TV shows that ran on the major networks, like school time, after school, you know, like 3, 30, 4 o'clock. And those always had really strong social messages. Um, and even on Saturday morning cartoons and stuff like that, because that's the only time when I was growing up that they showed them. They didn't have Nickelodeon or Disney that was showing t kids' TV shows 24 hours a day. So uh, they had a mandate that they had to have some sort of education to them. Now the mandate is pretty much gone. Uh, you can have a little public service announcement here and there, and, and which is kind of crazy because now we have 24 hours, but now it seems of TV programming for kids, but no, uh, you know, social messaging. So in something like the troop, I can honestly tell you that the, if I tried to pr present a uh, 
besides my very successful ice zombie metaphor for plagues that sweep across the world, that besides that, uh, <laughs> they would turn it down. No, this is not a time to do something like this. In my own way, though, and this is just this is small, this is not uh, particularly social messaging, but uh, the top four shows in kids networks and kids network are all have to do with kids who are musical superstars. And I was looking at it, and I was, you know, I've got a two-year-old daughter and a and a ten-year-old son, and I'm thinking, really, this is what we're going to say is, you know, what you should aspire. The most aspirational thing is to be a singer. Well, great, okay, you can, some people can be singers, but who's going to be changing the world? It's going to be uh, scientists and doctors, to, in my opinion, that are going to revolutionize and what's going to happen. So. When I had an opportunity to create a new show, I said, okay, I want to make a show about a bunch of kid geniuses, and that's what it's going to be about. So yeah, it's going to have the fun kid entertainment value, but at least kids can look at it and be a, uh, feel that it can be aspiring to, um, uh, to be smart. Look at all the things, the change that you can make, and maybe in little ways during that, uh, you know, I can uh, put some change, social change in that. So. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, this is a time we'd like to open it up to the audience. And we have a couple of microphones that we'll bring to you. So if you would like to ask the panelists questions, please, please do. This is your time. Yes. I know, no shit. I just, I want to thank the panel. I thought it was a, a really inspirational uh, panel, as, as uh, they often are with Sandra. I'm thank Margaret you. Miller. I'm a senior economist from the World Bank. And uh, it was a year and a half ago, Sandra and I started also talking about, you know, wouldn't it be great if there could be, um, you know, some kind of way to bring entertainment education and leveraging mass media to developing country markets. So I think it's just it's great to see this kind of thing discussed in such a way with the industry. Um, you know, it's, it's really exciting. And, um, at the World Bank, you know, we're dealing with a lot of these big issues, and I'm lucky enough to be here also on a scoping mission for the bank to see how we could, you know, leverage mass media and entertainment media, and um, you know, to deal with the kinds of uh, you know subjects that have been dealt with today: hunger and um, HIV stigma and education and health. So, um, and I'm just great to see the energy behind it. And it seems like a really propitious moment uh, in India for this. Um, one question I had um, that hasn't been touched on is just the kind of interactions, and I don't know how much you've been, you know, with the Indian, um, the, the American and Indian, uh, you know, creative community has been together on this trip, but just what what's kind of different, what are you getting from their interactions, you know, amongst yourselves that might be different from, you know, like within the Indian community or within the American community in terms of kind of, you know, insights from fellow filmmakers and writers and, Who would like to answer? Sure. Karen? I, well, actually, the, most of our particular journey, um, the, the, let's say, I hate to say the Hollywood contingent, that sounds so dreadful. Um, the folks from the United States, um, we have been here specifically to explore health issues on the ground. And so we've been deal talking to a lot of NGO folks and um, the people who are working in various local communities to sort of increase our exposure outside of the entertainment I industry per se. And so we're actually looking forward to this evening as a way to sort of have that confab that you're talking about with our Indian counterparts and hope that that's a dialogue that will continue hereafter. So we, we only have been here for three Three days. We've had three very intensive days of, of sort of site visits. Um, so the the actual sort of industry socializing is yet to come, but we're looking forward to that as well. The the one thing that I will point out is that I wish he was still here because when he was talking about the child labor in his film, and we have such strict laws about televi for television at least about how many hours kids can work, and they have to have the tutor, and they have to go to school even if they don't want to, and how many hours like little babies can work and that sort of thing. So I thought that was a very interesting contrast that I'd like to know more about. Thank you. Would you like to go next, Ramesh? Hi. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for a lovely enlightening session. And uh, it kind of brings back memories. 
But 25 years ago, when America had loaned us the ATS-F satellite, India went into rural education and programming. Uh, and that's the time I got to work on certain kind of programs and where we learned how to create entertainment with a purpose. Mm. So we made educational programs and cultural programs, but everywhere were we trying to educate. While we were shooting those films, we also kind of got for a feedback mode, we went out to the villages and, and, and saw that they, they kind of knew a lot more than he could tell them and they were trying to tell us to how to, you know, program our films because uh, we were talking about, uh, how do you say, planting seeds at the time of harvesting. Anyhow, what happens now is how today we can now compare and contrast our notes because as Vinta said that your health problems are something different. You know, you have rich men's diseases and we have little basic malnutrition. <coughs> but believe you me, malnutrition is a problem of rich people in India because uh, if you go to one of those, you know, wealthier people, they will give you uh, almonds and this and that, but they, or mithai, but they won't eat nutritious food. So they do get TB and things like that. Now, how do we now try to understand where health issues, even our health issues sometimes are not the issues of the elite or, you know, the urban areas where the satellites reach, which is what O'Neill was talking about, the B and C towns. This is something that we need to get into because actually we get down to communication, basic communication, reaching out to a certain level of people. It is audiovisual entertainment. Yet our level of education or speaking of a common language, like in America, you, you speak English. You have your Hispanics and everything, but somebody has a little smattering of English all along. Here we do not have a single common language. How do we do that? Would anyone like to respond from the panel? Uh, yes, Sedema. Television, probably that's why it stands out, is uh, it's not easy with all the languages, as you say, but the language, the body language, and uh, expressions and visuals that you can present in cinema or television are certainly, uh, uh, they, they can cross those barriers. Uh, but that is up to the artist, whether he's a writer or a director, how to come up with that medium 